I'm Josh Ravenbark, a member of the World Affairs Planning Committee, and I'm honored to be introducing our speaker tonight, Pico Ayer. Mr. Ayer is the author of nine books, Observing the World and Cultures Converging. These include Video Night in Kathmandu and other reports from the Not So Far East, The Lady and the Monk, Four Seasons in Kyoto, and The Global Soul, Jet Lag, Shopping Malls, and the Search for Home. His most recent book, The Open Road, describes 35 years of talks and travel with the Dalai Lama. Based in Japan, Pico Ayer writes often for Harper's Time and the New York Review of Books and regularly travels to far-flung places such as North Korea, Ethiopia, Bolivia, and Bhutan. And I should also mention that he is the author of my single favorite essay of all time, Why We Travel. It has been a particular joy to host Pico Ayer and discuss a wide range of topics, including the benefits of seeing the world, the street food of Vietnam, the heat of summers in Japan, the importance or relative lack thereof of learning a local language, and a little bit of bragging as to the opportunities afforded to students here at Iowa State. I also must confess to having made the claim to our lecture director that of all the drives I've made between Ames and Des Moines, the drive back picking Mr. Ayer up from the airport uh, was probably the most enjoyable. So with that, it is my great honor, and I ask all of you to join me in welcoming our speaker tonight, Pico Ayer. Thank you so much, Josh, and, and thank you, Claire. I'm having such a good time here, I never actually want to leave. Um, I really feel instantly at home here in Ames, and I'm so amazed that so many people have shown up. I think you're probably all here early for the president of Southern Sudan, and you're just keeping your chairs for the next uh, four days, and three days until he arrives. But thank you for, for showing up here. I, I can't tell you how honored and, uh, and thrilled I am uh, to be in this beautiful hall uh, and in this distinguished university with its 152 years of history and it seems like every student I've met in the last 24 hours spends his whole life in, in Vietnam or the Sudan or Rwanda. Or I've got this sense of a very exciting international community and people really traveling in order to make a difference in the world. And I'm also just so happy to be in Iowa um, among the meadow larks and the incredibly tasty hamburgers uh, and just the friendliness of everybody. I think all of us know since Field of Dreams the famous line, is it heaven? No, it's Iowa. And that's sort of how I feel, and I'm really tickled that uh, unlike, I think, most of the places where I'm asked to lecture, uh, this seems to be a series pretty much organized by and selected by students. And that touches me, because I, my assumption is whenever I meet a student, they want to run in the other direction as fast as they can. So I'm really delighted that the students who organize the World Affairs Committee um, worked so hard to bring me here. Um, now, I'm guessing you can just about see me uh, over the podium Mixed blessing, probably. Um, I say that because I, I got to hear the distinguished uh, New York Times columnist, uh, David Brooks, a few months ago. He came to my ho semi-hometown in California. And as soon as he came onto the stage, there was this excited ripple of whispers all around me. And I leaned in to hear what people were saying. And they were saying, my goodness, this guy is so small. Um, and David Brooks gave, I thought, a masterful lecture for about an hour on President Obama, whom he's known for a long time, on the war in Afghanistan, on the state of the nation. He answered questions for about 30 minutes, then he left the stage. And when he left the stage, everybody around me was talking. So again, shamelessly, I tried to hear what they were saying, and they were saying, yeah, that guy is really tiny. <laughs> it made me wonder if poor David Brooks had to come all the way to California to deliver his speech. So I think regardless of what I say or don't say, you can leave after an hour and say, that guy is very, very diminutive. We couldn't see him over the podium. Uh, but uh, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll just offer one more uh, apology before I really begin, which is that, as you can see, with a great stage behind me, this is ideally set up for some very exciting visual presentation. Uh, and I'm so low-tech and so incompetent. As you can see, I've got no PowerPoint, no slide projector, nothing. Uh, and it's mostly because I just don't know how even to turn on a light switch without setting fire to a whole building. But um, it's, it's also, I suppose, because of my sense that to some extent so many of us are getting so bombarded by images these days that at times it seems we don't know really what to do with them or how to make sense uh, of them. Even by the end of the last century, 
The average human being in a room like this would see as many images in a day as a, Vietnam oh, as a Victorian person would see in an entire lifetime. And sometimes I think with all the multitasking and split screens and running headlines that are around us now, we get so inundated that the world starts to make less sense rather than more sense. And so sometimes I almost believe that just the word, the spoken word, the naked, unadorned word, actually may have a power now that it didn't have uh, 10 or 20 years ago. And it can bring us back to ourselves or it can teach us attention or at least it can make us focus on a single point. Uh, so that's a nice way of justifying that the only visual seduction you're going to get for the next hour is one scrawny Indian standing here with a pen that doesn't write and a, and a pad that he filched from the Gateway Hotel about three hours ago. Um, I was actually giving a talk at Google uh, this time last year, and I, I was just talking the way I am now. And as I looked out over the sea of faces, I noticed they were looking really stricken. Uh, in fact, they were looking sick, I would say. And I realized at some point that they were waiting for the fun to begin. They were waiting for the entertainment to start. And at last, I had to say them, to them, I'm really, really sorry. Um, I don't even have a PowerPoint. So proof positive, everything I say is going to be powerless and pointless. Uh, and I fear that may apply all too well for the, for the next hour. But uh, I was told that you dealt last year with the theme of can we save the world. Uh, and I'm, I'm guessing, I'm hoping you decided we could. Otherwise, I might as well just go back and fly home this evening. But assuming we can fly, uh, save the world, uh, I was told that my mandate today was to talk uh, about where do we go from here? What do we do with the future? <coughs> and I must admit, I sometimes think of myself almost as a citizen of the future tense. And it's not because I'm so far-sighted or so plugged into the moment or because I know what's going to happen tomorrow. I think it's just because I actually have a clearer sense of my future than uh, of my past. Uh, the simplest question in, in the world probably is, where do you come from? And I think for many of us, and I can see in this room a lot of you would fit this category, that very simple question becomes ever more difficult to answer. Uh, if somebody asks me, where do you come from, I think, well, if where you come from means your blood or your ancestry, then I'm 110% Indian. But I've never lived a single day of my life in India. I can't speak a word of any of its 1,652 dialects. So I don't know I would co be comfortable calling myself Indian. If where do you come from means where were you born and where did you grow up and where were you educated, then I belong entirely to England. Uh, except that the day after I finished my education, I left. I've almost never been back there. And I don't think I look like anybody's version of a typical classical Englishman. Uh, if where do you come from means where do you pay your taxes and where are your doctor and your dentist, then I've been a member of this country since I was about seven years old. But most of those years, I've been carrying around this funny little pinkish card with green lines running through my face, identifying me as a permanent alien. And actually, the longer I'm here, the more alien I seem. Uh, so I'm not sure I could really call myself American or whether I sound American. And if where do you come from means where do you spend most of your life, I've been living most y months of the year in Japan for 23 years, but all those 23 years uh, I've been on a tourist visa. I don't speak very much Japanese, as Josh was alluding to, and I don't think any Japanese person would be very clean, keen to claim me as a member of his community. And I don't think my um, example is very interesting or important, but what strikes me when I travel around the world is that especially the younger people, student age, and most of you are, are that age, it seems you have more and more different homes that you can choose from or that you can put together into new combinations. And especially when I go to the big cities of the world, let's say Toronto or Hong Kong, Sydney, New York, it seems that all the young people I meet are much more multicultured and international and omnidirectional, really, than I am. They have maybe one home that's associated with their parents and another home that's attached to their partners and another home that happens to be the place where they are right now, Ames, uh, Iowa, maybe, and another home that's maybe the place of their dreams, the one that they really want uh, to be rooted in. And I think part of the real excitement of this modern moment in the new century is that people have a much greater choice of homes than ever before, and they're pushing these choices together to make um, entirely new kind of fusions. 
uh, these, these people that I call global souls, the people for whom globalization is taking place really at the level of their soul or their conscience or the Im their imagination. And I'm guessing for many of those people, including some of you, you have a much better sense of where you're going than of where you came from. Uh, roots may not be so important to you, but destinations may be. Uh, and I know, again, when people ask me, where do you come from? Uh, I often change my answer depending on who's asking it, but sometimes I'll just say everywhere because it's too difficult to explain. Or sometimes I'll just say nowhere. Uh, and sometimes I'll actually say, well, my parents were born in India and they came to England and that's where I was born and we moved to California. And the answer goes on so long that the person just rolls her eyes and walks out of the room before I'm finished. And she probably senses it would take me a whole lifetime to begin and maybe to fail to answer that question. And when I think of all that, I think sometimes of my grandparents. And when they were born, which was not a million years ago, all four of my grandparents almost had these little cards given to them when they were born, saying, this is your race, this is your religion, this is your tribe, this is your caste, this is your nationality, these are your friends over here, and those are your enemies over there, and you'll spend your whole life locked within this system. And now it seems to me <coughs> that in only two generations, all of that is up in the air, and more and more people, including some of the people I've met at Iowa State today, are creating from scratch almost their sense of tradition and their sense of community. Uh, their sense of home, even their sense of self. Uh, and of course, cyberspace is a very good example of this because you may feel very close to somebody you've never met or you may feel a very strong sense of community with people 7,000 miles away. Uh, and to me, it's very exciting that what used to be a given, essentially you were told who you were, is now chosen, is something that we can craft if we want to. And of course, like any opportunity, it's a big challenge because unless you very consciously decide, this is who I am, this is where I belong, this is where my affiliations lie, then you can sort of fall between the cracks, like between the gratings and a sidewalk. But if you rise to this opportunity, it means that you can really do things that were not so easy for most human beings through most of history. Um, I have a little nephew and niece aged four and three, and I recently noticed that they have been to more countries already than our last president had been when he came into office as the most powerful person on the planet. And I don't think that's a reflection on him, but really on them and how much the world has changed just in the last 50 or 60 years. Uh, in fact, just I'm remembering now, a few weeks ago, I got an email from a friend of mine who's Indian and therefore inevitably lives in New York. Uh, and therefore, <laughs> inevitably, is married to a Pakistani, uh, and therefore, inevitably, grew up in the Gulf states. Uh, and he was telling me about his little daughter, Zara, uh, and she's five months old. And he said, well, of course, you know, she's only five months old. She hasn't had a chance to see much of the world yet. But she has been to the Dominican Republic, and she's been to Britain, and to Germany, and to Austria, and to Switzerland, and to Spain, and to Italy, and I'm just about to take her to Moscow, and Dubai, and Singapore, the next thing I heard from him, they were watching the World Cup in, in South Africa. And I worked out that little Zara, by the time she was 11 months old, would have seen 15 whole nations in the world. And of course, when you're five months old or 11 months old, you're not really registering much. She probably would barely know that she was in a different country. But still, into that young imagination are going all those spices and sounds and smells, the, the sights of every kind of continent. And even at a very young age, she's registering how many people look different from her parents and how many places are radically unlike her hometown of, of New York City. And I think it can be only a good thing to be exposed to so many different places at a young age and to realize that you'll probably be a combination of those places. And the more I heard about little Zara, the more I thought, well, she's ideally suited to be the next president of the United States. And she has a curriculum vitae already, kind of like President Obama's. And even if she doesn't become a president, she's perfectly suited to become a, a movie star at the very least. Because any time I go to the Cineplex, there's Jessica Alba, for example, who's a quarter Danish, a quarter French, partly Mexican and entirely American. And she's probably playing next to Keanu Reeves, who's got English, Chinese, Hawaiian, Portuguese blood, born in Beirut and, of course, grew up in Toronto. And I think one of the interesting things about this new century for me is that even somebody who doesn't travel, and I know many of you in Iowa are very, very rooted and have really strong connection to the soil and to tradition and to your family and to your farms, but even the person who never travels 
is seeing the whole world coming to her doorstep. Um, I'm thinking even of my, my 82-year-old mother-in-law in Kyoto, Japan. She's never been outside Japan. Uh, she's hardly ever been outside Kyoto. In fact, for years, she hasn't been outside her little neighborhood of old wooden houses in the shadow of a fox shrine. But every time, every morning, when she walks out of her house and starts walking down the street towards the fox shrine, she's being blasted by Bruce Springsteen song. She's hearing Russian spoken by the women who work in the local bars. She's seeing headscarves worn by visitors from Malaysia and Indonesia. She's seeing signs in English. And even she, at age 82, has to think about how she can make her peace with all these different cultures. Uh, when, when my grandparents were growing up again, um, all those places really seemed like the far corners of the earth. Uh, they would never see somebody from a culture different from theirs. And now I think the other is in your neighborhood, the other is in your backyard, the other may be in your bedroom, uh, the other may even be in yourself. And I think that's one reason why, to me, the world is getting more exciting uh, with each passing year. Because what I, one thing I've noticed in my travels is that let's say there's a half Korean, half German girl and she's living in Paris. As soon as she meets a half Thai, half American boy, she, real, she recognizes him as a kin. She knows that he will understand her much more probably than somebody who's entirely Korean or entirely German, that his questions are her questions, that really they have a lot in common. And these kind of people are forming a, a floating community that you see all around the world and in all our major cities and even small towns here in the United States. And as often an, as not, when the half Korean, half German girl meets the half Thai, half American boy, they get on so well that they become a couple, they move to Berlin, they fall in love, and the little girl who arises out of that love and union, of course, is partly Korean, partly German, partly French, partly Thai, partly American, and partly German, and more cultures than you know what to do with. And everything about the way she sees the world, she responds to it, the way she writes, the way she thinks, the way she sings, I think is all going to be something different. It's going to be much more complex and much more intriguing than somebody, um, than perhaps her grand great-grandparents would have had the chance uh, to be. And I think that's why when we talk about world music or fusion cuisine or even world literature, what we're seeing are these combinations that hadn't been dreamed of where global soul meets global soul and creates a whole new glo global culture. Uh, I, I, I hope there aren't too many English majors in the, in the room, but I, s for my sins, studied literature and nothing but literature for eight years, getting more unemployable every year. Uh, and in those days, it was not such a long time ago, 70s and 80s, studying English literature meant studying a guy called Hardy, guy called Dickens, woman called Eliot, man called Eliot. And now, I'm sure, if I went into those same classrooms, English literature would mean studying people called Rushdi and Ishiguro and Ondachi and Tan and Lee and all kinds of names we can't even pronounce. And it's as if this very stuffy house of the English language and English literature has uh, had all its doors and windows thrown open to admit new spices and new rhythms, new stories, in fact, whole new ways of telling stories. And even those of you who follow American literature know that the, the literature of the new century in this country is being hymned into life by people called Chimananda Adichie from Nigeria and Gary Steinegart from Russia and Juno Diaz from the Dominican Republic and Chang Wei Li from Korea. And I think they're all writing on the assumption that when a Russian thinks about his many homes and the issues of migration and how he can distinguish himself from his parents and how he can assimilate into the US, he's writing in a way that makes absolute sense instantly to a Taiwanese second generation immigrant or somebody from, uh, from India, that they're all dealing with the same kind of issues having to do with this world in movement. And new writers are coming up to deal with uh, a whole new sense of readership. And I think for me, again, one of the great advantages of this is that if you define yourself a little differently than previously people could do, you can step maybe a little beyond all the enmities or res the resentments of the past. And by that, I mean that, let's say, if, if I called myself an Indian, maybe I would think of Pakistan as an enemy. Or if I define myself as British, then maybe people from Britain's former colonies would rightly see me as an oppressor. 
Or if, when I came to this country with my parents, if I called myself very defiantly an American, maybe I would have thought of the Soviet Union or uh, Cuba as an evil empire. But by defining myself in some way that has nothing to do with nationality, by saying I really like Sigur Rós and I love Scorsese movies and I like Graham Greene books, in some ways uh, I'm allowing myself to move out of those history-long oppositions between uh, groups that are very, very close together. And, uh, well, maybe I'll tell a, s um, a, a story. Um, well, I'll, I'll wait on the story for, <laughs> for a few minutes. But uh, when I was talking to um, an honors group this afternoon, and then again at dinner, the, the wonderful subject of Kentucky Fried Chicken in Beijing came up. Uh, and the reason it came up is that I'm sure many of you here, people say that the world's getting really homogeneous, that wherever you go on the globe today, as soon as you step off the plane in Beirut or Saigon or um, Peru, what you see is Christina Aguilera on MTV, a Starbucks on one side of you and the Golden Arches on the other. And people say that the whole world is turning really into a single big suburb of Los Angeles. And I must say, that's never been my experience. When I travel, it seems to me the world is more different than it's ever been, more diverse, and sometimes more diverse precisely because of the illusion of closeness. And so I'm going to be back in Japan on Sunday. And when on Monday I head inevitably towards my local McDonald's in Japan, just down the street from my apartment, as soon as I go into the McDonald's in Japan, the first thing I notice is that most of the customers are dressed in Armani or Prada or Dior. The second thing I notice next week is that they're all eating Tsukimi bur burgers, which means moon viewing burgers, which speaks to the classical East Asian habit of observing the harvest moon in, in, in the last week of September every year. They're also eating chicken tatsuta burgers and corn potage soup and all kinds of things I couldn't begin to explain to you. And the real thing I notice is that everything about the way they're speaking or not speaking or hiding their, um, their mouths every time they laugh or shyly avoiding eye, eye contact is just as 1,000% Japanese as it always was. I, I know I'm not in Kansas anymore for sure. And then sometimes that same month I will find myself in my parents' India. And when I go to a McDonald's in India, most of the people there are vegetarian. There's a really strong smell of spiced cardamom tea uh, and everything in the McDonald's is a spiced and raucous and overcrowded and intense. It's all the streets and, and city around. Essentially, it's become an entirely Indian artifact. And then, sometimes that very same week, I'll find myself in La Paz, Bolivia. And when I'm walking along the beautiful flower-bordered promenade at the center of the, that uh, city, La, the Prado, when I go to the McDonald's there, there's an armed guard on watch constantly because it's such a status symbol to eat at McDonald's. Uh, when you walk in, there's a little display case where for some reason, the last time I was there, there was a Seiko watch on display. And the prices are much, much higher than in the chic French cafe next door. Uh, and it's, so, it's as if all the world is dr drawing from a common pool of global or pop cultural or American images, but they're all converting it into their own context and their own culture and their own language and tradition. And so it becomes something radically, radically new and different from place to place. It's as if all the world is going in to see the same movie these days, but we all come out of the cinema having seen a totally different film. Every culture sings Lady Gaga in a different accent, essentially. Um, and I, I remember this really came home to me. I don't know if any of you saw the movie from about 10 years ago called The Sixth Sense, but by chance I saw that film in Japan when it came out. And in Japan, all the ghosts who feature very prominently in the movie, nobody was phased by that because they got lots of ghosts in Japan going back 1,500 years. In Japan, what really freaked them out in the sixth sense was the psychiatrist because traditionally they don't have psychiatrists in that culture and they were really disoriented by the notion of you know, somebody playing with your mind. Uh, I, I could imagine other cultures, uh, maybe Islamic traditional cultures, where the scariest thing in the sixth sense would not be the ghost or the psychiatrist, but just the notion of a single mother and a young woman trying to guide her child alone through a difficult and challenging world. And then, just by chance, I did happen to see the sixth sense when I got back to California. I saw it for a second time. And in California, everybody was just amazed that Bruce Willis could act. 
um, especially without throwing his fists around. So uh, it's a trivial example, but I think you can take any piece of global culture and see how it acquires totally different consequences and, and, and meanings wherever you go. I think all the world is probably watching Avatar this year or at the beginning of this year. But in China, Avatar was a rather unsettling propagandistic attack on how major powers oppress their indigenous peoples, for many people there. Uh, I'm sure in Iraq, when they saw Avatar, they took it to be a reflection of the policy debate in Washington about whether to bomb the country back into the Stone Age or to win its hearts and minds. When we see Avatar here, it's just a very exciting new universe of 3D technology. But again, um, I think it has such different meanings that really it becomes Chinese Avatar in China and, and Iraqi Avatar in, uh, in Iraq. And many of you may know, a hundred years ago, it was said that Britain and America were divided by a common language. And now I sometimes think the whole world is almost like 200 cultures divided by a common pop cultural language or frame of reference. And even if you have a Mongolian, a Nigerian, and uh, a Bolivian in the same room, even if they're all speaking English, I think they're still all mutually incomprehensible, the same way they would have been if they were speaking Mongolian and Spanish and a Nigerian dialect. In other words, um, all the many props and movies and movie stars and s musicians we have in common aren't necessarily bringing us very, very closer. Um, and I remember when I was in Cuba, I used to go to Cuba every year, and one day I was just across the street in Havana from the University of Havana, and I was with a group of kids pretty much the same age as you, college-age kids. They spoke better English than I did. They knew more about my country than I did. Very, very sophisticated cosmopolitan um, kids at 20, 21 years old. And inevitably, at some point, the question came up, where do you come from? And I'd been to Cuba many times before, so I knew the right answer was America. Because almost every Cuban then, and I think still now, has brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, sometimes even husbands and wives in this country. But because of the enmity between our government and theirs, in those pre-internet days, it was very hard to make a telephone call from Cuba to the US or the other way around. Letters almost never seemed um, to, to arrive. And so whenever um, I told people where I came from, they said, oh, please, will you take this letter and send it out to my loved one as soon as you get back to the United States. So we were talking about where I came from, and I said, well, I, my mother lives in California. And a, a light came to the eyes of one of these young students. And he said, oh, my brother lives in Canif California. And he, he's got this big house, and he's got a swing pool, and, and tennis courts, and more limousines than he knows what to do with. Please, please will you take a letter from me to my brother. And I'm really hoping he can do something, anything, to free me from the difficulty and privation of life here in Cuba and take me to the United States. And so, of course, I, I took his letter back with me. I probably got about 40 other letters that week. And I knew from my previous trips to Cuba that every time I sent these letters out, some of them would come back to me saying, addressee unknown. Uh, some would arrive on the doorsteps of Cubans who, having escaped from Cuba, never wanted to hear or think about it again. Uh, some would arrive on the doorsteps of Cubans who, when they escaped, arrived in the most dangerous parts of New York and Miami and literally didn't survive, were, were very quickly dead. But this time, for the first time ever, and I was really amazed, I got a letter back only a week later from this little place I'd never heard of called Tamal, California. Uh, and the brothers wrote, you know, Dear Pico Aya, thank you, thank you for sending along the letter from my brother. Um, I think about him, I think about... Cuba all the time. And I don't know if you know or if he knows my circumstances here, but I'm in San Quentin prison and I'm on death row. And I'm really, really hoping my brother in Cuba can do something, anything to free me from this and get me back to the Cuba that I miss so much. And whenever I travel, and these kind of things happen a lot, and many of you who've begun to travel may have encountered stories like this. Whenever I hear that the world is getting smaller and how much more we know about the world, I just think about these two brothers. They're in countries separated only by 90 miles. Neither knows the first thing about the other's circumstances. And even more poignantly, each is reaching out to the other in the hope of, of, of getting saved. And I think we sometimes speak about a global village because a village is a very consoling, warming kind of idea. And it suggests a village green and village elders and the rhythm of the seasons and wisdom passed down from generation to generation. But I think 
on a big level, in some ways, we're moving more into a global city, uh, more into a kind of version of Los Angeles exploded to the size of a whole planet, where the soundtrack is not necessarily the soothing sound of a village folk lullaby, but more the very amped up, aggressive, shouting hip hop sound of an inner city where people are fighting, a bit like the City of God in the Brazilian movie, um, if you saw that. Uh, you, some of you probably know that when the 20th century began, one in seven people in across the planet lived in a city. And uh, when it ended, one in two did. And for the first time in human history, the majority of people live in cities. And in so many of the major cities of the world, from Sao Paulo to Cairo to Jakarta to many, many others, it's almost as if the countryside is flowing into the city and, and taking it over. And even as there are those few global towers that belong to the 21st century, a lot of um, the, the, the resentments or the, the hostilities of a 19th century are, um, are flowing in. And when I was talking about the excitement of this new century and the new ways we can define ourselves, and I think that is very exciting. Of course, I was speaking mostly of people like us in this room who are fairly comfortable and have the luxury of being able to think about where our home is or where it might be and who our people are. But of course, the vast majority of people who are thinking about home on the planet in new ways are people who were forced out of their homes by war or poverty uh, or circumstances and never wanted to leave them but now have to think again about what home means. And by certain counts, the number of refugees in the world comes to 200 million people, which is an incredible number. It means if you take the whole population of Canada and add to it the whole population of Australia, and then add the whole population of Australia again, and add the whole population of Canada again, and then double all of that, it still comes to fewer people than belong to this great floating tribe that we're reading about every day who are clinging to inner tubes to get from Cuba to the US, or who are shivering in storage trucks to try to steal into Europe from um, China, or who are literally hanging on to the undercarriage of planes to try to get to places of affluence or opportunity very far from their own homes. So I think sometimes when we say that it takes a village to make a child, it can also take a global village to unmake or to undo um, a child. And uh, as I was saying, when we, when we think about all the exciting aspects of globalization, I think we always have to think about how globalization means globalized responsibility and globalized uh, conscience and, and globalized concern. Uh, and so as I was thinking about all this and, and thinking actually, I suppose, in some ways about the question that I was asked to address today, which is where do we go from here? A few years ago, I did something really crazy. I don't recommend any of you do it. I did it so that none of you would have to do it. <laughs> and that was to go and live in Los Angeles airport for two weeks. Um, and it was because in part, I felt I'd been lucky enough to see many of the great places of the past. I'd been to the Taj Mahal and Machu Picchu and the Forbidden City and um, the pyramids at Giza. But I thought it was much more important really to see the future because the future is something we can still change. And I thought that in certain ways, a big US airport is a perfect representation of the global city of tomorrow, of the way that um, our major centers will look 20 years from now when all the people of the world are gathered uh, under the same roof, but perhaps they're walking past one another or talking past one another. I remember in LAX at the information booth, there are 116 different languages spoken, and yet you get the sense that no two people are really speaking the same language. And airports are major cities. As you may know, Dallas Fort, Fort Worth Airport alone is larger than the whole of Manhattan. And the other reason that I thought it was worth spending time in, in that particular airport thinking about the future was that I had worked out that I spend 40 days a year in an airport or an airplane. Uh, and that's almost six weeks of every year. And that comes to obviously more than 10% of my life. So if I lead a normal lifespan, that could come to six or eight years of my life in this place that I never stop to think about. And my friends who are in business or IT work or actors or musicians travel much more than I do. They regard me as a stay at home. So they're probably spending 10 years of their lives in these nowhere spots. And I'd often notice when I was flying from, let's say, Santa Barbara to Easter Island, of course, I would think and know a lot about Santa Barbara. And I would read and research a lot about Easter Island. But I never stopped to think about the plane and the airport where, in fact, I'd be spending three or four days of a, of a two-week trip. And one of the things that was so interesting to me about any airport, I chose Los Angeles because I think more than any other city in the world, it's almost a terminus of dreams. Wherever I go in traveling, 
people are still listening to Hotel California. They're still watching Baywatch or some modern equivalent. They're still following every last movement of Britney Spears, Lindsay Lohan, or Brad Pitt. And California occupies such a major part of the world's imagination. It's, it's the place where so many people dream of coming. And what struck me in the airport, among many other things, was that it's the site for some of the most significant life-changing experiences in our whole existence because people are sending their loved ones off to war there or they're taking off on honeymoons or they're seeing parents that they haven't seen for 50 years or they're saying goodbye to people they don't know if they'll ever see again and they're sobbing or they're kissing, they're praying. They're places of great human drama of the kind that Shakespeare or Homer would have recognized and yet physically what you see in an airport is more or less a mix of a hotel lobby, a food court, and a shopping mall. So these very intense human places are taking place in these very placeless, generic um, sites. One of the other things that was really interesting to me um, in the airport was to look at what I suppose I regard as the single most foreign state of all, more foreign than Yemen or Paraguay, and that's the state of jet lag. And I'm sure most of you have spent a little time there. Many of you, if you travel, spent a lot of time uh, there. And you all know it's not quite a drug state. It's not quite uh, a dream state. But it's certainly an altered state. Uh, and more and more of us are spending more and more of our time there. And I think of it as more alien than India or Haiti because no one's drawn up a map to it. There are no guidebooks to this place. No human being had ever set foot in the world of jet lag until 54 years ago when a Secretary of State coined the term. And yet now it's more and more part of our lives. Um, I mentioned before I live in Japan and my mother lives by herself. She's 79 now in California. And I think, well, it's a normal human thing for a son to visit his mother four times a year. So I try to do that. And if I visit my mother four times a year, it means I spend eight weeks of every year completely deranged. Because for one week after every crossing of the Pacific in either direction or every, any crossing of the Atlantic uh, in any direction, I'm really not responsible for anything I say or do. Um, I can walk and I can talk after a fashion, but I don't know what I'm saying and I don't know where I'm going. Uh, and after a while, when I noticed how much of this time I was spending, so eight weeks of my life, that's 15% of my life. Again, if I lead a normal li lifespan, that could come to 10 years of my life in this netherworld known as jet lag. And so when that struck me, I decided to do two things. Firstly, to try to turn this to advantage, to make jet lag a way to see things in the world I never could see otherwise. So as soon as I flew back to uh, Asia, I'd go to some new city, I'd arrive at midnight, it was nine in the morning in my stomach, and I would just walk and walk and walk all night from midnight to 9 a.m., see parts of the city I would never see otherwise, probably see parts of myself I would never see otherwise. And then when I flew back to my mother's home in Santa Barbara, I'd go out for lunch at four in the morning. And again, I would see a completely different city than I'd seen in all my years there. Uh, I thought there's no way to fight against it, but if I work with it, then maybe it can open some windows for me. The second thing I decided to do was actually to try and chronicle what I was doing or failing to do in a state of jet lag and conduct a kind of experiment using myself as a guinea pig. So for several years, every time I was jet lagged, I would write down everything that was going on. And I noticed just how, um, uns well, yeah, how mad I was, I suppose. Uh, I noticed that I would be writing wildly emotional letters to people I'd never met. Um, I would come out of even Ben Affleck movies with tears streaming down my face. Uh, I would return to California and I'd, I'd collect a check made out for $13,000, which is a lot of money for me. And I would slowly and laboriously make out a deposit slip for $130, go to the bank, do myself out of $12,870, and wave to the teller and say, have a nice day. I really noticed how much, you know, because the, the, the conundrum of jet lag is you think you're able to function, and it's only when you stop to see what you're doing that you realize that you don't have a clue. And I was interested in it because to me it spoke for the sense in which humans are living almost at a post-human speed. We're doing things, as I said, wonderfully that humans have never been able to do before, but some of them may be things that humans shouldn't do. And when I think of the future, I almost think of kids joyriding in a Porsche around blind curves at about 140 miles an hour, which is very exhilarating, but also a little unsettling if you stop to think about it. And the more technology there is in the world, the more that we're speed it up and the more we feast on speed and the more we feast on speed the more technology we need until sometimes we find we're almost in this accelerating roller coaster that we never quite wanted to get on but we 
can't really um, get off. We have more and more pieces of information sometimes, but as I was saying at the outset, less and less sense of what to do with them. More and more ways of communicating, but sometimes uh, less and less to say. Uh, and even the absent-minded godfather of the global village, Marshall McLuhan, the Canadian in the 1960s, said, you get going very fast and you end up in the wrong place. And so as I travel, I've been thinking about the ways in which space has really been expanded for us. We can go places and do things that nobody could before. Skype and, and many other, and the jumbo jet and so many other forms of technology have opened up space to us. But at the same time, time seems to be contracted almost to this second. Uh, the, the election of President Obama seems to me not two years ago, but 200 years ago, because so much is happening every day and we're taking so much of it in. It's, it's hard to remember even the time when Tiger Woods was a great icon. That seems like ancient history. And yet, if we'd been meeting on September 17th of last year, Tiger Woods was still this unblemished exemplification, I guess, uh, of the American dream. And I guess the part of the problem of technology may be that it doesn't teach you how to use technology. All the data in the world doesn't tell you how to sift through data. Uh, all the images in the world don't tell you how to make sense of images. And I just read um, a couple of weeks ago that they'd found one girl, teenage girl in Sacramento who had sent 300,000 texts in a month. <laughs> That's a very impressive figure because it means that if she's sleeping eight months, uh, eight, eight months a day, if she's sleeping eight hours a day, and I really sh hope she is, uh, still she must be sending 10 texts every waking minute for 16 hours every day for 30 days of a month to reach that, that figure. The average American now spends eight hours of every day in front of a screen. And uh, a very reputable science research firm found that 28% of the office day, so if you have an eight hour day in the office, more than two hours are completely destroyed every day because of information overload. And that comes to a net loss of 900 billion dollars uh, every year. So it just speaks to my sense that I exult in technology and all the things that it allows us to do as we couldn't do before, but there's always a shadow side and whenever something new comes into our life, we throw our arms around it and it's only perhaps after a few years that we begin to realize that there's a cost that comes to it. And so I noticed once that I'd accumulated 1.5 million miles on United Airlines. And it's that great system where you spend six days cramped in a little seat eating food you don't want to eat and watching a movie you don't want to eat and then you get the seventh day free. So I thought, well, I've got lots of movement in my life. What I need is stillness. And I started going to a monastery and it instantly my head felt so much clearer and I began to see much more precisely what I could do with my life, what I cared about, what direction I should take. It's almost like in any road, including the information highway, it's only when you step off it that you can really see what direction you want to be going. You can reset your... GPS, inner GPS. And I've noticed more and more just in the last few weeks, people are saying that soon the ultimate luxury will be a coffee house that says no Wi-Fi. Uh, people are already spending $800 sometimes to stay in hotels which deliberately offer no TV and no telephone in every room. And I think that's a shock to the younger members in, of this audience. But at some point you may find it, it's, it's a wonderful thing just to, to be free of all those distractions. So as, as we start, or I start to come to a conclusion of thinking about where do we go from here, I thought maybe the best thing I could do was to um, talk a little bit about perhaps the most conspicuous traveler in the world, one of the most celebrated global souls and probably the most famous exile, whom I've been lucky enough to know since I was 17 years old, and that's the Dalai Lama. Uh, and uh, my father met him the first year he came into exile in 1960, and so I've been lucky enough to spend 35 years talking and traveling with him. And every November he comes to Japan, he'll, so he'll be back in a few weeks. And for the nine or 10 days that he's in Japan, I spend 10 hours every day from 7.30 in the morning when he comes out of his room to 5.30 in the afternoon when he goes back to his room, about three feet away from him. And I sit in on all his closed door meetings with politicians and uh, with power brokers and with scientists and monks and also with old friends. And so it's given me a wonderful opportunity to see a world I never would be able to see otherwise. And of course, to the Dalai Lama, almost every door in the world is open from the White House to the Vatican. And when I think about the future, I look at his example and I, I walk around with him and try to learn from it. And I think there are three things that I've really noticed that he's taught me, even though I'm not a Buddhist and obviously I'm not a monk. And the first one is the importance of 
going to the root of everything, if you want to change yourself or if you want to change the world. Not to keep repainting the car, as it were, but to rewire the engine. So that sounds very abstract, but I guess what I mean is that wherever he travels in the world, in the course of his lifetime, he's found that people more and more have all the material goods and facilities they could ever want, and yet they're still lonely or confused or scared. Uh, and he's noticed in the United States and Europe, but then in Japan and Korea and Taiwan and soon maybe in China and India, that people's material resources are really pretty well taken care of nowadays, increasingly, which is wonderful. But their inner resources maybe are, um, are not as rich as they would like, that getting the third house doesn't make you feel more at home, but in fact less at home in the world. Or getting your sixth car doesn't give you a great sense of freedom and mobility, or but more, it, it's, a, it's a burden of responsibility. And so he always says, and it's, it's very obvious, but I'd never really thought about it until I heard him say it, that so many of us spend so much of our time working on our bodies. You know, I, at six this morning, I was in the Gateway Fitness Center doing 30 minutes on the treadmill, and yet we never think about our minds. We never spend 30 minutes a day working on our minds. And yet our minds are much more fundamental to our happiness, our well-being, our mental health. Because if your body is really weak and broken, but your mind is strong, then you're pretty much okay. But if your body is super strong and your mind is weak, then usually you're really in trouble. So it makes much more sense if you just want to lead a, a happy life to start um, taking a few exercises if you can to make your mind clearer or sharper or more settled. Certainly do the 30 minutes in the fitness center, but maybe add 30 minutes in mental fitness center, whatever form that met, might take. Um, the second thing I noticed is that whenever he travels and he's meeting foreign people and, and foreign experiences, which happens almost every day of his life, he always says, well, it's really good that we're different and we should uphold those differences and we wouldn't want a world where everybody is the same and where everybody has the same religion and has the same beliefs. But whenever you meet somebody, you've got to start working from common ground. So your first thing you do is find what you have in common with this person from Syria or this person from Guatemala or this person from uh, Afghanistan. Uh, and I remember four years ago we were in Hiroshima and we were going up a hill towards a little temple that a Tibetan monk had been running there for many years. And as the Dalai Lama walked up the hill, suddenly a young woman walked forwards, strode forwards, and she shouted, Lama, Dalai Lama, I need to talk to you, I'm God. And of course she got hustled away by the bodyguards. And the Dalai Lama went to the top of the hill and he sat in the temple, he consecrated the temple, he meditated there for about 10 or 12 minutes. And I was sitting next to him and as we were sitting there, we could hear her yelling and, and hurling curses um, outside. And when he stepped out of the temple to go off to his next appointment, to my amazement, um, he, s he called his security to him and he said, please bring that woman to me. And he just stood about five inches away from her and he cupped her face in his hand and he looked into her eyes and in his not perfect English, he more or less tried to convey to her, well, you've got nothing to be afraid of. I, I'm your friend. We have more in common than apart. Uh, and we're just human beings struggling to get together, struggling to, to make the best of our lives. Um, and so please don't worry. And I don't know if that really had an effect on her, but I thought it was a very, very good example because if somebody were to stand up now and start heckling, I'd be out behind that curtain instantly. I think most of us, when we're confronted by violent opposition, all we want to do is run away from it. And he was saying, well, nothing is gained by that. The only way you can begin to disarm and diffuse the situation is by meeting the person who's yelling at you and seeing what you might have in common. Um, and it's only when you have some kind of encounter or dialogue that you can begin to step forwards. Um, but turning your back to someone who thinks differently is going to make the problem worse and worse. The other thing that struck me was a couple of years after that, he was in Japan for maybe eight days, and he had one day free in Tokyo. And so I just naturally assumed, well, he'll spend it talking to politicians or holding an international press conference to get his message out across the world. Or maybe he'll be spending the day kind of schmoozing with the many very prosperous and powerful people who are really concerned about Tibet. And as it happened, he spent the whole morning with a group of 14-year-old boys in a school just talking to them. And then he spent the whole afternoon with another group of 14-year-old boys in a school just talking and listening to them. And the next year, he had one day free, and he flew down to the southern island of Kyushu and spent that whole day with a group of school girls. And I think it was his way of saying, which certainly applies to those of you who are students in this room, that these people of student age 
are really the power brokers in the world. They are much more important than the current CEOs or prime ministers because the people of student age are the ones who are going to be forming the world we live in 30 years from now. And he felt it was much more important to speak to 14-year-olds than to cabinet ministers because they were both more open to transformation, more ready to talk, more happy to get guidance, and also, um, in some ways, they were the future incarnate. And when he went to Tokyo and gave a big speech, an equivalent of Madison Square Garden before thousands of people, so many of the things he said were taken from the schoolgirls he'd met the day before. Uh, and of course, when he was talking to the school kids, he was not talking as a head of state or a head of a major religion or a monk. He was just talking as a son and a, somebody who'd been a schoolboy himself and, and, and a brother and talking from the position that he shared uh, with them. And I was saying to the honors program when I met them this afternoon that that's always been my experience when I'm traveling. When I sit home at home in California, when I think about Syria or Cuba or Vietnam, all I think about is how different they are from us, how opposed perhaps, even how hostile their government may be to ours. As soon as I go to one of those places and I get out of the airport and sit, step into a taxi and start talking to the taxi driver, all I see is he sounds exactly like me and my friends in this country. He's complaining about his government or he's fretting about the economy. He's worrying about how to send his kids through school. But really at the human level, which we often forget when we're just sitting at home thinking about on other places, uh, he, he makes all the sense in the world to me and is the opposite of an enemy. He's just a friend uh, that I haven't met. Uh, the third and final thing that I learned from the Dalai Lama was that I, I recently spent five years writing a book about him. So I sp I, most of that time was spent in research. And the single most impressive thing that I found was that in 1959, when he fled, fled Tibet, because Tibet and China were moving towards a violent confrontation, and he realized that the only way he could protect his people and his culture was by leaving Tibet and going into India. Uh, so he was 24 years old, and he undertook this very hazardous trip for 14 days over the highest mountains in on, on the planet, the Himalayas, and finally got to a new life of freedom in exile in India. And the very first words he said when he left his country of Tibet were to his little brother, who was then 13, and he said, now we are free. And I thought that was amazing, because as we see it, he's just lost his country, he's just lost the people he was born to rule, he's just lost his destiny, his whole reason for living, but instantly, he's not seeing it as loss but he's seeing it as opportunity. And the minute he set foot in exile, he realized he could do all kinds of things in exile that perhaps he never would have been able to do if he'd stayed in Tibet and been surrounded by all those centuries of tradition and, and ritual. Uh, that actually exile and losing his country gave him the perfect chance to remake his country. And that he could, for the first time in history, uh, give women in the Tibetan community the chance to get doctoral degrees and become abbots, as he did. And for the first time in history, he brought modern science into his monk's curriculum. And he said, now you have to know what's being discovered at Cal Caltech and MIT and other places. You're not a good monk unless you know the scientific facts of the world. Uh, he could actually bring the modern world into Tibet and Tibet into the modern world so that each could learn from the other. And maybe most important, for the first time in Tibetan history, he actually gave his people democracy. And his first year in exile, he made up a constitution with a little clause that said, if need be, let's impeach the Dalai Lama. And of course, what he was really trying to do was give his people a very stable and durable home outside Tibet until they could return to Tibet. But to me, what was really impressive about that was he was saying that to some extent, you change the world by changing the way you look at the world. Every one of us, almost every day, faces a lot of difficult situations and looked at from one angle, their frustration, looked at from another, their possibility. And this isn't a Buddhist idea, it's a, it's a human idea. I, I remember I encountered it in high school. We had to study Hamlet, and Hamlet says, there's nothing good or bad, but thinking makes it so. Whatever the situation is, to some extent, you're making it by how you choose to look at it. The old Stoics at around the time of Jesus were saying, circumstances don't make our lives. It's our response to circumstances. War comes down on a million people and each one of those million people responds in different ways, constructively or, or not so constructively. And it, to me that was a very exciting idea because it suggests we're not completely hostage to circumstance. We have much more power than we think to decide how we're going to make our lives and therefore make uh, the world. You probably know that a lot of people now think most individuals have a kind of happiness quotient and they've done a lot of research and they've found that if somebody is suddenly rendered paraplegic, 
she reports after about a year of very difficult adjustment, she's no worse off than she was before. And if suddenly somebody wins the lottery, after a year of celebration, he tells researchers he's no happier than he was before he won the lottery. In fact, sometimes he's unhappier. He's spending his whole time with lawyers and accountants. He doesn't know who his friends are. He's maybe living in a posh neighborhood where he doesn't feel comfortable. And it's a way of saying that circumstances are much, pay much less a part in whether we're happy or not than, in to some extent, the choices that we make. And I guess to go back to what I was saying at the very outset of this talk, to bring it to a, a conclusion, one of the things I heard the Dalai Lama say, and I think some of you in this room can relate to it, is that home now has less and less to, be to do with a piece of soil and more and more to do with a piece of soul. I think home is almost something invisible in the values and the friendships and the affiliations we carry around with us. We're almost becoming like snails, carrying our homes around with us wherever we go in the world. And home is not where you sleep, it's perhaps where you stand. And I guess I'd always thought that, but then it came home to me in a very vivid way because I was in my parents' house in California a few years ago, and I saw a distant line of orange in a hillside, and I went downstairs to call the fire department, and by the time I came up, there were 70-foot flames surrounding our whole house. As you know, wildfires fires regularly storm through the hills of California. And by the time the evening had ended, the, 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 the fire had wiped out my house, wiped out everything in it, uh, everything we owned, almost wiped out me, and then charged down the hill and taken out about 450 more houses. So literally, the very next day, if somebody said to me, where is your home? Of course, I couldn't point to any physical construction. Home would have to be whatever I carried inside me uh, and what, what sustained me in some ways, uh, my, my portable, mobile, uh, in, invisible home. Uh, and again, I think that's one of the interesting things that the new century has opened, that as our sense of home has changed, our sense of community and our sense of accountability has changed. And to me, one of the most exciting developments of the new century is how many of our leaders have really decided that their constituency isn't just their hometown or their home state or even their country, but the entire planetary neighborhood. Uh, think of Bill Gates, for example. He used so much resourcefulness and determination to make billions and billions of dollars and now he's using that same resourcefulness and determination to give away billions of dollars to the people who need it most in Bangladesh or in Africa. Or think of Bono, um, lead singer of U2, who always is telling us that um, a grandmother who doesn't have enough food in Ethiopia or a kid who's restless on the streets of Burma is just as much our concern, maybe just as much our problem, as somebody in Ames or Des Moines who is homeless and doesn't, doesn't have enough food. And we see every day how something we do in Iowa has consequences in China or vice versa, uh, and that we can't think of our community in very, very small ways. So when I think of where do we go from now, I guess ever since I was a little boy, the question I've always asked myself is what can I do that my grandparents couldn't have dreamed of doing? And the first answer I came up with was tasting the world firsthand. My parents, grandparents, could never dream of meeting somebody from Nicaragua or Somalia or Vietnam. Uh, I've gone to those countries and been lucky enough to enjoy their culture, but even those people who don't have the time and the resources to go across the world, if you just go to Chicago or Minneapolis or New York or San Francisco, most of our major towns, you can eat Ethiopian food, you can hear Ni Nicaraguan music or Cuban music, uh, you can see all the customs and the culture and the rich philosophy of Vietnam. The world has come to your doorsteps and so you have a better chance of understanding these far off cultures uh, than you ever had before. And as you can probably tell from everything I'm saying, I've got great faith in the individual. I have much more faith in the individual than in larger bodies because my sense is that governments nearly always think about us versus them. And corporations are by their nature rather competitive or divisive. One company's loss is another company's gain. But I think individuals think in a much more nuanced and human way. And I often remember, as you know, our country's been at war with radical Islam for 15 or 20 years. But not everybody remembers that the single most popular poet in the United States for the last 15 or 20 years is actually, of all things, an Islamic poet, an Islamic mystic, Rumi from the 13th century. And somehow or other, Rumi is speaking to contemporary Americans in a way that Emily Dickinson or Walt Whitman or even Shakespeare is not. 
And conversely, uh, I've heard on very good authority that if you go to the northern suburbs of Tehran in Iran, most of the people you meet are absolutely definitive on desperate housewives and sex in the city. They know much more about those kind of things than we do or than anybody in the United States. But they're as fascinated by aspects of our culture as we are by theirs. And so I always have the sense that individuals are reaching out across cultural boundaries to make contact with others at the same time as, as governments and, and corporations sometimes are, are trying to keep us apart. So I guess when I think of what, where we go from here, one thing I think of is thinking of home in a much broader and, and more exciting and more imaginative way uh, than we have before, even if your first answer to where is home is Iowa because your tradition and your family has been here for a long, long time. It's wonderful to have that roots, but also you can think of home in different ways. Uh, secondly, I guess to enjoy all the, the new th things and possibilities that come into our lives, but not to assume that they have to supplant the old. Often the new can just make the old stronger. New technologies allow us to do the basic old human things better than ever before, but not to assume that we need everything uh, to be new. And I suppose finally to exalt in the way in which people have so many more homes than they ever had, more choices than they ever had before I at every level, and yet never to imagine that all the difference in the world is going to go away. Well, you've been incredibly patient listening to this long, long spiel, um, and I think we have about 20 minutes for questions. So if you have any questions, please fire away, and thank you for listening. I'm Steve Wilson here. I have a <coughs> I've noticed in many of your essays that you talk about the edge of religion, religious institutions. You have many essays on um, monasteries mm. in Japan, in Tibet, or Leonard Cohen in a monastery, Zen monastery in California. So to me, that suggests you have a great deal of interest in the religious side somewhere, you know, or maybe even holiness with the Dalai Lama. Are these things that are your values? Is there such a thing as holiness? Why are you so interested in these? Ah, thank you. What, what a wonderful question. Uh, you probably heard it. The gentleman was asking about my interest in holiness. And I so appreciate your knowing my work so well. You know it better than I do and you know all its intricacies. And yes, indeed. I mean, both my parents were professors of comparative religion. So for years, I assumed I wanted no interest in religion. But as the years have gone on, I've found it's in my genes and I can't escape it. And I think it's an example of what I was talking about of in terms of global possibilities. So I'm a 100% Hindu person. I was educated entirely in Christian schools. Uh, I've lived for 23 years in deeply Buddhist Japan and spent time with the Dalai Lama, who's a Buddhist. Uh, and I spent nine years researching a novel on Islam because I thought for Hindu or for a modern American where Islam can seem like the enemy, it's an important thing to, to humanize the other and to see um, how unthreatening he would be, he might be. And I think my interests have always been two part, m movement and stillness. So I spent maybe the 15 years just traveling everywhere I could around the world, so I would feel that I had a very good sense of what the world looked and felt like. And then I probably spent about 15 years sitting very quietly in one place, because I think now I have to learn the, the inner universe and, and myself. The, in, in our, dis our whole lives are basically a dialogue between ourselves and the world. So I looked at the world first, and now I'm looking at myself, and I'm hoping that I can better understand both parts of the equation. Uh, and it's partly just uh, self-indulgence, because I mentioned that spending a time in the monastery, which I started to do 20 years ago. And uh, this was a few months after my house burnt down, in fact. And I have a friend who's a school teacher in my local town. And he said um, that he, every year he took his kids, high school kids, up to a Catholic monastery, even though he and they were not Catholic. And he said even the most the ansiest, most hormone-driven, distractible 15-year-old boys would go to this place and just being in silence for three days would feel much better. And by the end of the third day, they never wanted to leave. They felt as if they'd making touch with parts of themselves they never saw. So I thought anything that works for a 15-year-old kid ought to work for me. Uh, and I drove up and the minute I stepped out of my car and I went into a simple room uh, with a private garden and then a slope of eucalyptus trees and at the bottom just this great bowl of the Pacific Ocean and at night more stars than I could count. 
I instantly realized this was the most exciting adventure that I had undertaken, more fun than many of the trips I'd taken. And it seemed more like real life than when I was working for Time magazine in a little cubicle in 25th floor in, in midtown Manhattan. And so I went back three months later, and then I went back to that monastery four months later, and I stayed there for two weeks, and then I stayed there for three weeks once, and then I started staying in the cloister when there wasn't any room for the visitors. And it really began to seem to me as if that was my real life. Uh, and everything else was, was the consequences of it. And I guess the sensation was like, if you're, anyone who's in California knows this, if you're in a freeway and you're jam-packed at rush hour and everyone's playing their ho pressing their horns and shouting and the radio's at top blast, if you just step out of your car and you climb up onto a small hill next to the freeway and you look acro across, instantly you can see the larger canvas, you can see the deeper picture, you can collect yourself. Instantly you can really see w what you should be doing and what you care about in life. And so for me, the monastery became the one thing that made the movements popular, uh, possible really, and um, the way that I could direct myself so that when I came down from the monastery, even after three days, I would know exactly what I should do for the next six months, and that's often hard to know what to do. And I've been interested indeed in Leonard Cohen and. Uh, the Dalai Lama, because really they're two monks who are very much in the world. Uh, and I think it's relatively easy to sit on a mountaintop and think about the golden rule and clarity and purity. Uh, and it's relatively easy to be caught up in the middle of Times Square and excited by all the flashing screens and new diversions. But I suppose the people I most respect are the ones who can bring the clarity and stillness and focus of the monastery right into the middle of Times Square and show us what to do with our modern world. And I thought Leonard Cohen, who's an ultimate man of the world, but who chose to become a Zen monk for many years, and the Dalai Lama, who's a lifelong monk, but who's had to spend most of his life in the middle of negotiations in, in Beijing and Washington and Brussels, and right in the middle of the very real world. I thought, well, they're very interesting examples of people who are always going back and forth. They're not too isolated from the world. They're not too immersed in the world. They're trying to keep both parts alive. So I really appreciate um, your question, and you saw exactly the way um, my writing is, is, is tending. So maybe after I spend a lot of time looking at the monastic side, I'll go back into the, um, into the external world again. And I try to spend about six months still traveling and taking in the world and six months just staying in one place and traveling at my desk. But thank you for such a sensitive question. You talked a lot about um, commun or I'm sorry, people who have so many roots that they seem to have no roots, or so many homes that they seem to have no homes at all. Yeah. But at the same time, there are so many communities and towns nowadays, and cities even, that are working so hard to develop a sense of place mm. uh, and a sense of commonality, so that um, so that the residents stay there and have pride in their th in their town and where they come from. So. Is that a problem? Should communities s keep doing that, or should they um, should they give in to this kind of global culture and uh, ha coming from so many places that you're really mm. coming from nowhere? What should a community or town do to develop its sense of place then? Yes, Th thank you. That's a very very good question. And I would think in a place like Iowa, everyone here is rightly proud of what Iowa is and. I think part of the beauty of Iowa, as I understand it, is, as you were saying, that strong sense of place and a strong sense of a community that hasn't changed very much. And I would think um, a smaller place like Iowa would indeed rejoice in its continuity and would be glad that new elements are coming into Iowa without, while realizing that they don't change what's the essence of the soil. In a place like New York or Los Angeles or London, a big city, there, I think they formed communities, but those communities are completely multicultural. And they probably say the nature of this particular big city, like Bombay is a good example, but Paris is another example, is that through all its history, what's given it its, its zest and its savor is that it's drawing people from every corner. Bombay used to draw people from North India, South India, East India, West India. Now it maybe draws people from Scandinavia, Japan, South Africa, and California. But it still comes to the same thing. It's a melting pot, and that's its identity. And Iowa is probably a place of relative purity and consistency, and that's its character. I think a lot of towns, of course, can lose their sense of identity or lose their way in, in this modern moment. And as you said very well, not know which direction uh, they, should, they should go in. Uh, but I think the big places that 
are like international airports should make the most of that. And the places like Iowa that have more integrity should probably best off staying with it. Iowa shouldn't become a New York. Um, <laughs> and everyone would be the loser if it did. Uh, and New York might be a loser if it tried to turn itself into Iowa. And I think it's, it's a wonderful thing. We have both those options not very far from one another. Thank you so much for coming to Iowa State. If everyone would join me in a round of applause for sa thanking our speaker. <laughs> I'd like to remind you that there is a reception in the back and there'll also be a book signing as well. So thanks for coming.